it fast. Right here on the Anycast. Make it strong. Make it last. Right here on the Anycast. All right, I am here today with, I think the only person I consider a friend who, at one point in their life, has lived on a boat. I don't know what it is with me and boat people, but we generally don't get along. But Chris is the exception. Um, <laughs> For now. Uh, yeah, it's early. It's early. <laughs> Tell the world. Who's Chris? Uh, how'd you get here? Yeah, thanks, Matt. So, um, hi, uh, I'm Chris um, Beavers. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a, I am a boat person, uh, for what it's worth. Let's start there. I have yeah. lived on a boat um, uh, in Singapore, and I still have a boat. I don't live on it anymore. Um, uh, but I'm a tech person, um, startup person, You know, started a few companies, um, probably the one most people will have some familiarity with is this one right here, NS1, uh, you know, managed DNS traffic steering company that we started um, more than 10 years ago now uh, in New York and grew and sold last year to IBM. So there's that, right? Uh, the other one, Superman style is, uh, there it is, Netbox Labs, right? Um, which is which is what I'm focused on right now, very different um, business, you know, around Netbox, which a lot of folks I think are going to know, right? Open source network management, network automation tech, um, where I'm also founder CEO. Um, you know, Netbox, um, first of all, it's open source software, right? Like you need to go download it. You can use it. That's what most people do, right? Um, and it is used by networking teams as what we call the network source of truth, right? It is the system record for the resources and the configuration of the network, and it captures um as you would call it, like the intended state of the network. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, that turns out to be really important, especially as networks get complicated. You got to write it all down somewhere, right? Um, so the very first use case that most people start with um, on Netbox is network documentation, right? They've got all these Excel spreadsheets and wikis and, you know, YAML files. Um, and at some point that stuff breaks and you've got to get it into a model um, that the team can work with cohesively. That's the starting point for Netbox. But once you have that model, once you have your network written down, call it the intended state of the network written down in Netbox, um, pretty quickly, uh, you know, it starts to become the linchpin for automation, right? So people drive network automation around Netbox, and that's I think really created a ton of lift. Um, and you know, the reason reason I said earlier, I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with Netbox already is. Um, it's not a shiny new technology, right? Netbox has been around since mm, probably 2016 or so. I think it was open sourced by Jeremy Stretch, who's the project founder. And one of the reasons that we're building this business, Netbox Labs, around Netbox is it is everywhere, right? Everyone uses Netbox as it is today, right? So it's pretty pervasive tech in networking. And um, uh, it's been really fun now to start to figure out how do we build a sustainable model around it to continue to invest and scale and so on. That's what we're doing at Netbox Labs. Are there any other current technologies that really have your synapses firing or are you just so zoned in on this? Not technologies per se. And it, it, it's going to be on theme with being zoned in on Netbox, but I'm really interested in how open source and like composability of architectures and so on is going to play out in context of networking. Um, you know, I just don't think it's a it's an ecosystem or an industry or realm or whatever you want to call it um, that has seen the benefits of open source um, in the same way we've seen on, you know, the software development side or the call it the DevOps or site reliability or whatever side of the house. Um, and, you know, I don't know the answer, but I have a I have an inkling that open source can you know, really like the open source methodology, the notion of an open and composable ecosystem of tools that, um, you know, are built again in the open by communities um, can really accelerate the pace of technology change uh, in networking. And, you know, I think that that's sort of aligned with our mission, right? Like, I, of course, we have this mission of creating, uh, like I said earlier, this virtuous circle around Netbox and making the Netbox project sustainable. But I, I'd say another element of our philosophy, and this is stolen from Grafana, who has done this incredibly well, is what we call this notion of um, a big tent. And a big tent means um, openness and composability of the technology in an ecosystem, right? Like uh, we, we don't believe 
you know, NetBox has to be the winner all the time as a source of truth. Or we have other technologies in our business for things like network visibility or observability. Do you have to use those with NetBox? No, we want to work just as well with the tools, uh, other open source or closed source network observability tools or network automation tools or operational tools or whatever. Um, and, you know, that's a that's a new ethos um, that I don't think has existed very much in networking. Like you've got these big walled castle vendor ecosystem, the Cisco ecosystem, the Juniper ecosystem, the Nokia ecosystem. And I think open source can really crack that open. So that's not a technology per se. Um, but just for me, the first couple of years of, you know, experiencing the power of open source in networking through NetBox has, you know, really got me fired up about how bringing this ethos more widely and enabling more of an open source ecosystem and community in networking can accelerate the pace of change, um, accelerate the modernization of the whole stack. Um, and, you know, I would say like unlock innovation as as cheesy as that sounds, but I think it's it's really happening. Is there anything that stands out in your mind as something that, you know, 25 year ago you would be most impressed by on the internet, either in terms of like what's being done, the technology? Like I'll give you my example is every time I perform a speed test on my phone and I get disappointed that I'm only getting 600 megabits per second down from this little, you know, 25 years ago, I, you know, my first startup, we had an office with 45 people sharing a 1.5 meg DSL line. Um, and, you know, maybe someday we'll be able to afford a T3 for the office. And now it's just like, oh, yeah, there's just like an OC uh, 192 that, that hangs out in my pocket all the time. And I can, you know, fire it up anytime I want. To me, that's the one that like I could not I could not explain to 25 year old me that. how much bandwidth you could have over a wireless network anytime. I mean, I, I think that's a great one for what it's worth. Um, and I have sort of the same sentiment. But another one for me is just how pervasive it is, right? Like if it is not on the internet, if it's not online, it mm -hmm. does not exist in this day and age. And that's sort of like, I, it's hard to think about when that bit flipped, right? Like it, it definitely did. Sometime in the 2000s, that, that bit flipped. But, um, y you know, if you think back to, yeah, like 25 year old me or, or or younger, uh, like um, I was always excited when I could, you know, access a resource or interact with a company or something like that online. And now, uh, if it's not online, I don't want to deal with it, right? Like I, it, it, I hate phone calls, right? I hate getting on the phone and having to call somebody. Like, can I not please just fill out a form or click a thing on your website? Um, and um, uh, you, you know, I think the the young generation now is never going to grow up without that, right? But to me, um, like it's it's really exciting that we got and got to live through that bit flip, right? Like we understand how incredible this world is. It did not exist this way, you know, 15 years ago, um, and it, you know, it's never going to go away after this, right? So that that to me is like the pervasiveness is the big one. Yeah, I. Which, by the way, you know, all the way back to action. something you said right, yeah. at, right at the outset, sorry to interrupt, but something you said all the way at the outset, right? The reason I couldn't continue living on a boat, um, you know, 10 or 12 years ago is I wanted to go sailing and I, the internet was not pervasive in the middle of the ocean, uh, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. Now it is, it turns out, right? Like yeah. you can buy a thing and have the internet uh, in the middle of the ocean. So maybe, maybe again, um, uh, you know, I could, I could. I could sustain that way. All right. Well, I I can't think of a better note to leave it on than that. So, um, <laughs> uh, Chris, thank you for the time. Uh, thank you, for, obviously, for your expertise and friendship over the years. And uh, um, I'll see you somewhere on the internet, maybe from a boat, maybe not. But um, hope one way or another later. it'll be online yeah <laughs> that's right well thank you matt for having me this is a lot of fun really enjoyed the conversation and um yeah see you again soon this is different another round so much more to talk about gonna aim to satisfy with help from cash fly. 
get to it, do it fast. Right here on the Anycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here on the Anycast. The Anycast Podcast, brought to you by Cashfly.